um, welcome to this lecture on selective stimulation, which I would say is one of the key topics <coughs> when we perform electrical stimulation. Um, this is the difference between touching a cow fence and an electric one and, and getting really uh, sophisticated action in that. And you can imagine that this is not that easy. And you find many, many different approaches to that. I would like to stick today to, to not to make it too complex and complicated to the peripheral nervous system. And we see here a peripheral nerve in cross section and everything that is purple is nerve fibers. So the nerve fibers, as you know from the anatomy lecture, are grouped in fascicles, so in bundles, and if we are lucky, those bundles are responsible for certain actions. One bundle probably for stretching the fingers, the other one for flexing the fingers. And if you remember your experience on electrical stimulation at late last year, if you participated there, you know how difficult that is really to, 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 to obtain a movement that is desired. And the question is, how do we get that? Uh, this black blob on the right hand side um, depicts an electrode that injects current. And if we do that on a theoretical base, we might come up to this really not understandable graph set on the left hand side. That is how a dear colleague of mine, Frank Rattay from Austria, started about 30 years ago to simulate, um, to simulate nerve excitation by using Hodgkin and Huxley equations. That works pretty well, but we see one drawback of this approach, and, and this is the electrode there. Most of those simulations and and, and programs that you find start with an ideal point source. That is good for everyone who likes to simulate because a point source is just a dot and then you can start with everything. But if you are in real life, uh, uh, nothing is like an ideal point source, right? And therefore, it's much more complex to, to get those uh, effects if you have real geometries. And therefore, I like to, to shape my lecture today somewhere in between that. So we know there are some equations and we have to ask ourselves how can we validate that and how do, do uh, real life interfaces work. And before we start with that, how they work, um, we have to make our mind what selectivity means or what kind of selectivity we like to obtain. And as <coughs> you see there, um, in the outline, we have different ones. That's directional sensitivity. So if I'm somewhere here in my arm, do I want to stimulate downstream to the fingers or do I like to stimulate upstream to my brain? depending on the trauma, the, the, the situation, of course, but in, in general. And does it matter if I stimulate in both directions? Because if I stimulate an axon that is ideally infinite at an infinite length, and I stimulate in the middle, the axon uh, that I elicit might go in both directions. And sometimes I don't like that. Sometimes I want to have it only to the end effector and not backwards to the brain, for example. Because if it goes back and the spinal cord is still intact, we have spinal cord circuitry with some synapses and we might have some, some feedback loops uh, that screw up the whole effect. Yeah? If you stimulate the muscle and at the same time you stimulate the sensory fibers and the muscle that activates sensors that activate sensory fibers overlay with the stimulation that you have, um, you might disturb some control circuits uh, in the spinal cord, for example. So that is one thing. The other thing, starting from the cover page picture, let's say, is um, the fas fascicle selectivity. If I start with the idea that certain fascicles drive certain functions, it could be good enough 
first step to elicit one fascicle and not the other? Can I do that? And how many fascicles do I get? And which fascicles do I get with what type of nerve interface? And then the fiber selectivity. This is what we have already seen under the topic of inverse recruitment. So I do get the thick fibers first and I do get the thin fibers after the thick fibers. If I do like to reverse the order, what should I do? That I get the thin fibers first, even though they might have a higher excitation threshold than the thin fibers that are in close vicinity. And there are certain um, tricks that I like to show here. And the exciting thing for me is that all those tricks have been found out in the 1970s, 80s. Uh, and then people, researchers, seem to give up until then to find something that really works. So let's see what that means later on. So first of all, with the selective stimulation, we have some questions that we should ask ourselves. Um, and the question is, where do I like to stimulate? And if I know where I like to stimulate, the second question is, which electrodes do I need for that stimulation? And what is the use of it? That's also something that you should ask yourself. Always, what is your particular purpose in, in that uh, environment, in that project, in that research question? And do the other two things uh, follow that purpose? Yeah? And I'll comment later on what I mean by that. For today, it's the peripheral nerve. And in most cases, we have a mixed nerve. That means we have afferent and efferent fibers, so upstream, downstream. Um, <coughs> we can either put a nerve around, uh, an electrode around the nerve, not the nerve around the electrode. So an electrode around the nerve or take something different. So something different means I put the electrode inside the nerve somehow. And I'll have some examples with me what advantages and disadvantages that can bring. Um, if I have no nerve surrounding electrodes, I cannot play some of the tricks that I can play with nerve surrounding electrodes. The trick with nerve surrounding electrodes is that they really encompass the whole nerve with an insulation thing, so a cuff, and then I can try to focus the field inside and play around with field steering. This does not work if I have some electrodes somewhere and a lot of volume conductor in the middle where I'm not really sure what part of the current goes somewhere else than I predict. Um, but they can have um, other selectivity issues, so they are highly spatially selective if they're really small, but you cannot play the tricks with upstream and downstream, for example. And that is then um, in your application field, in your purpose, uh, after amputation, for example, I have no downstream, that's the missing link, uh, limp, so, so I probably am fine if I stimulate where I am, since there's nothing that could interact with the downstream signals. Yeah? And what is the use of it, um, of that selective stimulation? That can be either the separation of efferent and efferent stimulation or the graded control of a target organ. And this is an important, important point here. If you really want to, to get larger entities, so larger organs or, or a set of muscles, you might need more than one channel for that. And then you have to find out are those entities, so the fascicles for example, or the nerves, um, close enough that you can approach them with one device having multiple channels, or would you need multiple devices with multiple channels? And it is, this is a kind of the purpose question. So if, uh, if you would say, oh, I, I want to prevent misuse or, or disuse atrophy, I could stimulate the whole muscle at once just to train it. Then one channel could be enough. 
and then I would say take a large electrode. The larger, the better, then you get everything that is around and you can train that muscle. If you want to train subgroups or if you want to have a graded finger control, then you should use very small, tiny structures and one large pad is probably not adequate at all. But this is something that you have to find out very early on together with, with uh, health personnel um, in physiotherapy, in, in, in medicine, to find out what is really needed, what is the purpose of that, and then you can, can assign the adequate technology to the purpose. If you are working on your PhD, it could be that you are in a particular laboratory and then they have one tool and they explore new applications for one tool. And it's a little bit the other way around, but that depends on, on the circumstances under which you do work or, or you, you do your research. Yeah, and uh, the worst thing, uh, let's say the Champions League of activation, is that you try to separate different targets. Uh, then, then you really have the graded control and the separation of targets uh, means channels that are separated from each other and I show you later on some examples how that could look like. So, um, the oldest electrode um, beyond a wire um, is probably the cuff electrode that started in the mid-1960s um, and a lot of stuff a lot of stories that are told are told from persons um, who have manufactured things in the 1960s and in those years um, small was still much larger than today. If you remember the first mobile phones, they look differently than nowadays, right? And that is the same with the electrodes because certain technologies were not that mature that you could make things really small. And that means some results come from those days being linked to those old things. If somebody say, tells you a cuff electrode is always bulky, well, that's probably from a person who worked with cuff electrodes from the 1970s. Nowadays, things get smaller, get more sophisticated um, on one hand. On the other hand, some basic functionalities remain the same. If you have one contact, you have less selectivity than if you, have, if you would have two or three or four or five contacts. The advantage is, and this is important to know if we are on the peripheral nerve, we have the peripheral nerve and we have the nodes of Renvier if we talk about a myelinated nerve and to get stimulation we need to have a longitudinal field uh, between adjacent nodes of Renvier. That means it's clever to have electrodes one next to the other for electrical excitation. And for that there was an open cuff that is an helix and in the helix there were one or two contact sites. If you have one contact site you need a counter electrode somewhere at a further distance. If you have two they can be closely linked to each other. If you have an open cuff, that means the insulation around is, well, open and thereby the current can flow everywhere. On the other hand, a spiral has less material than a full cuff. And therefore the advantage is that, that um, you have less interaction between the material and the nerve. And if you handle a nerve and you, you handle it, normally if you look on a surgeon, you get, as an engineer, you get a bit afraid what the surgeon does with those nerves. So it, it's really a quite rough interaction. So it might happen that the nerve swells. If a nerve swells, it gets larger. If you have a fixed cuff around that, the pressure that the nerve gets by swelling the actual action force is the reaction force on the nerve. That means there is a kind of pressure on the nerve and if you have blood vessels in there, they can be occluded by that pressure and then you have a damage of the nerve. Um, if the cuff is more flexible, well, well, the easiest thing is make a larger cuff. 
right? Then the nerve swells, doesn't see the walls of the cuff, shrinks again, and everything is fine. But then um, the contact sites on the cuff, on the inner side, are at a certain distance to the nerve fibers, and you can look up those equations that, that it's a kind of uh, to the power of two. So by the square of the distance, you get higher threshold currents. In addition, you can either have uh, body fluid in there, that means there's a kind of low resistance pathway between the electrodes, the nerve has a higher resistance, so part of the current might prefer to go through the body fluid instead of going through the nerve fibers. Bad luck. Or even worse, that our, our body says, oh, this is a foreign body, I, I want to wall it out, so a lot of uh, foreign body cells, so fibroblasts, highly insulating, grow inside the cuff and separate the cuff from the nerve. And then you have an insulating layer in between the stimulation electrodes and your target. And, and this is also not very desirable. And therefore, there are certain rules of thumb how large your cuff diameter should be hello, in comparison to the nerve diameter. And this is uh, always uh, still under discussion. Um, there are certain rules of thumb, so take it 20% larger or something like that, and some person say, oh, it's, it's ideal, others say it's completely crap. Um, so this is still something you have to try out. Um, and if you have all the electrodes around the perimeter of the nerve, you can imagine that's probably relatively easy to get the surface of the nerve, but it's really hard to get to the core of the nerve before, because you always get something that's superficial before you get the deep fibers. And this is one of the disadvantages uh, with which we have to handle. And if we would dig much deeper into the philosophy of cuff electrodes, we would come to the point where we would have really strong discussions if we should have a spiral cuff or a split cylinder. Split cylinder means, in, in easy words, you have two halves, you put them together and glue them together. That means it is really fixed. The idea of a spiral cuff is that you have a spiral, and if the nerve swells, the spiral would open a little bit, and if it shrinks, it would shrink a little bit. That, that's a theory. In practice, a lot of surgeons take a suture, wrap it around the cuff, and make a, a tight knot and then uh, a spiral doesn't help very much if you have a thread around that. But, but this is more uh, in deep details. Um, Manufacturing-wise, um, spirals can be also uh, advantages from the manufacturing side. If you take silicone rubber, you can take two sheets of silicone rubber, you take one, you put the metal on that, you stretch another one, you glue it to the first one, and if you release it then, then it shrinks down and by that it curls. And if you're lucky, you have made the holes on the right sheet, that the electrode sides are really inside the cuff and not outside the cuff. Um, there's one application uh, that is really cool, one of the, the icons of, of cuff developers um, did that, and he used that having the the, the electrode contact sites on the outside of a cuff for an electrode approach where he approaches the nerves through the blood vessels. So you take your cuff on, on a catheter, push it through a blood vessel, and if you are on the right spot, you have your electrode contact sites on the outside wall and stimulate through the blood vessel wall to the target. Uh, this was Andy Hoffer in Canada. Um, there's now an approach in, in Australia uh, where this cuff is a stand, so a meshwork with electrodes on the outside, which is brought into um, blood vessels in the brain to stimulate certain structures uh, in deep layers of the brain. So uh, they're now in, in, in human trials. Seems to work. For me, it's a bit spooky to have something in my blood vessels in the brain if I have a disease, but it's, it's as spooky as having a neurosurgeon drilling a hole into my, my skull and, and pushing something through my brain. So, so it's uh, similar. All right. Um, so with that selectivity, um, 
I have to go back to, that st to those stupid questions. We have two options if we talk about selectivity. We could have the option to excite the fiber we like to excite and all the others are silent or a subgroup of fibers that we get with our stimulation and the others are silent. That is what our brain does. Yeah? And then we have option two. We excite everything that we get and afterwards we play some tricks to get some fibers silent after they have been excited. That sounds really stupid, but unfortunately that is the way we have to do that. When we think about excitation thresholds, uh, distances, we always get the nearest fibers first, we get the thickest fibers first, and in real life we quite often need to excite thin fibers at a certain distance. That means we have to play some tricks, and some of the tricks work with that idea of the refractory period. So that we, we get thick fibers first, but hold them in a refractory period and let the thin fibers come out of that again. You can imagine that works if you look at a certain time period after starting your stimulation, but that could be a bit awkward if you imagine your body would be stimulated first as many fibers as possible and then you get them silent again. That means the first few milliseconds or seconds might be a bit strange, right? If you get everything first and, and then you get the function afterwards. And this is an indeed one of the, the challenges that's still around, um, how to prevent that initial overshoot uh, with all those measures. So, after having those general things, um, I want to go now into the different flavors of selectivity and start with the directional one. And my goal for today is um, to, to bring some, some ideas to you that, you, that, that are easy to understand well knowing that the truth is much more sophisticated. So I'm not going with you through the latest differential equations and subgroups of whatever receptors here, which are involved, but, but like to give you an idea how that could work. And that would mean, as, as you probably know from your learning experience, if you start with a new topic, you, you try to get a grasp on, on a certain problem and make a first picture on that. And if you go deeper into the topic, you see that, that you have to correct your picture, that it doesn't hold true your first model for each and every little detail. And that is the same here with that selective stimulation. I want to keep it simple first and give you hints where the simple model um, does not describe the details. And that is true for most of, of the different flavors of selectivity. <clears throat> Here with the directional selectivity, the idea is to, in, in the best case, to excite a nerve fiber such that it conducts in one direction and does not conduct in the other direction. And if you remember that issue about sizes, of electrodes, then we have current densities, so the current that is injected divided by the area, so the larger an area is, the less charge per unit area goes through, so we can, can play with that. And if you imagine we have two contact sites and a volume conductor in between, um, it depends how close those contact sites are to generate a, a strong or a not that strong electrical field between two neighboring contact sites. And that is the idea here. We have a cuff around the nerve and we have three contact sites. The middle one is the cathode, so the one under which we like to stimulate, and the anodes left and right are the return electrodes. And what we're doing now is um, that we stimulate and we stimulate at that spot of the cathode. 
And if we have now a short distance to an anode, then we would have a kind of hyperpolarization under the anode, right? If we polarize the fiber under the cathode and the anode has the opposite polarity, we would get hyperpolarization. If the pulse is long enough and adapted to the nerve conduction velocity, we can say, okay, we generate an action potential, that action potential travels with a certain velocity to the anode, and if the anode is still in hyperpolarization, the action potential is blocked due to the hyperpolarization of the nerve. It's so much in negative values that the, the incoming action potential still prevents excitation at that spot. And if we do it right, it doesn't matter if this is a fast nerve fiber, so a thick one, or a thin one, if the pulse is long enough and both come in when we still have the hyperpolarization. That is the right-hand side on the button picture. If we go to the other side, to the more distal one, we have a large fiber that is fast, and now the dis distance between the cathode and the anode is different, so it's longer. So the fast fiber would be, let's say, fast enough to run in the last part of the counter pulse, which causes hyperpolarization. And then it's still blocked. However, the slow fiber, the action potential comes later, the pulse is still back to zero, there is no longer hyperpolarization at that spot, and this slow signal can pass. That, that is the idea of that directional selectivity behind that. Um, we have an asymmetric current injection. This is something we, we have to do thoroughly if we design uh, the current sources behind that um, to see that it really works and we have to, to check for chemical safety that the, the amount of charge, so the area under the curve, is the same for, for cathodes and anodes. Um, with that hyperpolarization and that nerve conduction velocity, I find this is a very appealing um, model to understand that. Um, however, this is only halfway true. The real truth is that longer pulses and these um, anodic pulses generate changes in the ion channels. So there's a modulation of, of transconductance in the ion channels that comes on top of that and is really, let's say, the, the ground truth why, while there is a blockade or not. But for understanding the basic principle that conduction velocity and hyperpolarization is, is a good picture to my opinion. If you want to dig deeper, you find out that hyperpolarization is caused by changes in the, in, in the ion channels there. So, how to work on fascicle selectivity? I have to say this is one of the, the most prominent examples there. That you have different fascicles in a nerve and you want to approach one fascicle and you don't want to get the others. Um, and you want to limit the electrical field to certain spots and that brings us from a ring to spot size electrodes around the perimeter. Um, You can either then try to get rid of the superficial fibers by bringing them in, into a ref refractory state. That is another option. Um, for example, by pre-pulses or you want to focus the electrical field. In deeper nerve areas, that is still called steering current. But you cannot imagine that it is like with a laser beam where it can go to one spot or the other since the electrical field cannot be focused with current. So that means the electrical field is everywhere and you can add another electrode that distorts the electrical field in a way that, that it is shaped in a different manner. 
but that still means that the superficial layer C in electrical field is not that you get the electrical field somewhere at the end of the room without having it here in the front. That, that doesn't work on that concept, with that concept. So, and saying that, I now start with a series of examples. And with cuff electrodes, there was one group who did nearly all the work on that at the Case Western Reserve University in Cleveland, Ohio. Um, and they have explored all of those different arrangements. So the easiest arrangement is you have one contact and a ground electrode somewhere. And having one contact ring and a cylinder of insulating material around, you get a certain electrical field shape. Um, the current is injected in the middle here in that monopolar configuration and it exits at the edges of the insulation material. That is not that bad. And if you have spatial selectivity, you can place certain amounts, let's say four or six contact signs around the perimeter. Let's start with four, then it's easier, then we have zero degree, 90, 180, 270 and 360 is then again the first contact. By that you can kind of cut the cross section of the nerve into four quadrants and could probably get four subgroups or if you combine adjacent contact sites probably you can get the intersection in between 0 and 90 somehow. Mm. The beauty of that approach is with that monopolar, um, monopolar configuration you need only one ground electrode and you need only one wire per contact site. That means four wires for a four polar electrode. Um, and you create something that is called a virtual electrode where the field exits the cuff at the edge between the cuff end, left and right, and the nerve. If you say, well, if I have several electrodes and I have only one ground outside, I don't know that well how the electrical field is shaped, depending which contact side I take. You're completely right. And for this case, um, these, this group um, invented the tripolar configuration where a cathode in the middle is, comes with two anodes left and right. And if you inject the current in the middle and you collect with a, let's say with a source and the anodes are the sinks, in an ideal case, no current leaves the cuff. That means everything stays inside. In ideal world. Yeah? Um, you can add an electrode on the opposite side of the cathode. That is then called current steering. And you modify the electrical field by playing around with that potential here, so you, you, you push a current transversely through the nerve and longitudinally and if you vary the amplitudes you get certain effects that you drive um, some fibers in the refractory state while exciting others um, directly. And you can do this with um, monopolar basic configuration or with tripolar one. Um, the steering currents should be 50 to 75 percent of your excitation threshold. And this brings the first take-home message. Whatever we do with that exciting more and getting certain fibers in the refractory state needs more energy. That means we apply more charge so the regular charge on the longitudinal electrodes plus 50 to 75 percent on the steering current of that, which is still sub-threshold, but modifies the ion channel dynamics and causes more 
energy injection into the nerve. Um, if we make it halfway three-dimensional, um, we see um, the arrangement on the right-hand side for four electrodes on the perimeter. And if we have those tripoles, we need three cables per stimulation channel. That means three, uh, three times the number of wires we have to integrate in the device compared to monopolar stimulation. And the funny thing was that this, this group around Thomas Mortimer in, at the case, uh, they, they worked about 15 years trying to convince all, all the world that tripolar is the ultimate approach to get the best selectivity ever. And the last paper before he retired was that he gets the same selectivity with monopolar stimulation if he plays around on the length of the cuff. There are, other, there are other things that you're still uh, a bit better with tripolar ones, but when it comes uh, to the complexity of the device, um, the question of the purpose pops up again. So what do I really need? Do I need that, that tiny little selectivity? Um, can I prevent some crosstalk between adjacent channels? that comes then with the electrode and the electronics in the background. So how many independent current sources do I have? And if you do not take care, you might have independent current sources that have whatever interconnection on the ground level that might cause current flow from one channel to the other. And if you have that, that current might cross some nerve fibers and might excite them. And if we talk about side effects in quite a lot of applications, it's about a non-ideal combination of a limited number of current sources with uh, not the best connection of those current sources to the electrode. Um, that you have some current flow from electrode one to electrode two on two different nerves, and this causes then an excitation of some tissue in between that you neglected before. Um, and this might cause a contraction of a muscle that you don't want to get. I've seen that once in a project where I participated, um, that there was a bug in, 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 the, um, in the system that caused the foot flexion when switching on the system before stimulation because that ground level of, of the power supply went, unfortunately, to the ground electrode um, against which the other electrodes were stimulated. And if you switch it on, the current flow was going and collected over the channels, and then the nerves were stimulated and the foot flexed um, at an idle state of the stimulation protocol. That was one of my worst moments in life when you activate an implant after 12 hours of uh, surgery and you see something's going wrong. Um, we fix that, or the colleagues fix that then uh, after strong discussions and another, I guess, two months. Um, but the whole implant um, electronics had to be exchanged. I mean, that, that, that's, a kind, that's really a serious second intervention then if you have to, to disconnect everything and exchange the implantable pulse generator there. Yeah. Um, with those steering currents, um, I go to the monopolar one that's probably a bit easier to explain. Um, you want to get deep laying fascicles. And the idea is you have plus minus here and plus on the opposite side. So the idea is by those steering currents that you can pull, let's say, the electrical field a little bit to the inner side of the nerve. They are, if they would be super threshold, you would get the superficial fibers here and the deep fibers. If they are sub-threshold, and you imagine now that you have a lot of ion channels on, on a nerve cell surface, this current would go to certain ion channels, let's say more on a stochastical base, would not be able to excite enough of them to, get an, to create an action potential, but this sub-threshold is enough to make them open and close again and keep them in an inactive 
closed state. And by that, you get the superficial layers where most of that current flows um, into an, into an uh, inactive state, so that refractory period of the nerve, and then you pass the real pulse longitudinally. So first the pulse 75% transversely, and then above that the longitudinal pulse. Right, right. Y you can do that um, synchronously. Uh, that's more sophisticated for the stimulation uh, electronics. If you have them a little bit delayed, which is easier from the control protocol of, of the stimulators, uh, then also works. So, now one of my favorite animations from 100 years ago. Um, so the idea was, can we use that cuff electrode on a peripheral nerve in paralyzed persons to stimulate selectively different muscles of the hand. Before going to, to a person, it was necessary to find out if this works, this general principle in an animal experiment. And so for reasons uh, that were not in my hand, my colleagues decided that the pig is an ideal model for that. If you have seen a pig hand, you know that this is completely different from our hands, right? So you have horn, uh, they have a different kind of shoe, and but let's stay with that. We took a pig arm, right? And the idea was, can we activate, and this is a real pig nerve in cross-section here. So, so this is how a pig nerve looks like on the arm, so the forelimb, um, about 30-ish 30, 30 fascicles. And a cuff electrode was placed around with six electrodes. Um, the black spots are the electrodes. With the idea, if I now stimulate one contact site or the other, I might get subgroups of fascicles. And if I'm lucky, I could probably separate the, the pig fingers, the wrist, and the shoulder. Yeah, this would be ideal for spinal cord injured persons, then you could say I have the different muscles group for hand movement, um, probably lower arm and upper arm. And this is the peripheral nerve and in the pick it goes to three different groups here of muscles and if I put the electrode around, hello, and I stimulate with one contact site, I get one muscle. If I stimulate with the other, I get the other muscle, and there should be here a red dot here. That does not work with that. Here we go. If we go backward, you see them. <laughs> so different contact sites, um, different muscles. If we go get backward, we see in this uh, uh, combination of Camtasia and PowerPoint the, the blobs. If I go forward, you see the different muscles. Um, so we started with four contact sites around the parameter because it was state of the art in, in around 2000. Um, we had certain diameters, certain distance here, and we compared them to six contact sites on the parameter. And when we manufactured or designed the six contact sites, we found out, oh, we have made a mistake. Um, would have been nice to make the last experiment with smaller electrodes but everything was already done. So, so we have now that mismatch. That's, not, that's something you should prevent in your thesis. Think twice before you start making masks or devices um, that you can have the same size of electrodes, for example, that nobody can show, can show up and say, hey, come on, that's just because the area is larger that you did not get the effect you want to get. All right, and how did it look like? So we had that pick. We had a stimulator and we have to, to quantify the results and there were two options. First one was with, with, with strain gauges, strain gauges and fishing hooks. Uh, fishing hook on a strain gauge 
and then that stuff hooked to a tendon of that muscle group. That was really tedious in surgical preparation. Second round was with needle electrodes on muscles to record the EMG. So muscle activity and see do we get separate muscle activity. Um, so this is how the cuff electrode looked like on the pick arm here. Um, you have to identify the, right ner the, the correct nerve first here, the radial nerve, and then the contact sites are wrapped around. Uh, so either here um, with the wires and the strain gauges or later on in the second one with the muscle recording system. Stimulation was done in an old-style stimulator uh, where the counterpulse is, uh, is created by the discharge of a capacitor. So you charge and parallel a capacitor while you stimulate and then you switch over and discharge that capacitor. Um, and our colleague was very keen on using pulse width modulation. For us, probably it would be more intuitive to stick with a certain pulse width and vary the amplitude. But if you remember that strength chronoxy curve, um, yeah, that 1 over x curve, uh, where we have the stimulation threshold depending um, how long the pulse is and which amplitude we have, we can also take the same amplitude and vary the pulse width to get the same effect here. Um, and that colleague was very keen on, on varying the pulse width for reasons I still don't get today after so many years. But that's the same, so results are comparable. And what we see is uh, uh, disillusioning because we get um, all the muscles here um, always at the same point in time over all electrode and it's just an up or down scaling, but there's nothing like selectivity here. And uh, that, that was the point where my, form, my PhD student to that uh, point in time got, got really nervous because that was close to the end of his time. And then luckily, um, oops, he... So nothing works here. And then we switched to the six contact points around the parameter and we were all satisfied because if you use here uh, this electrode for example at 120 degree you get um, all toe extensors, no, nearly no wrist, no shoulders. If you take the 240 degrees you get the wrist extensor, no shoulder, no fingers. And if you take the zero one, you would get um, the shoulders. And the beauty of a cuff electrode is that you do not have to align it. As long as if you have enough contacts, you can just flip it around. That's the advantage. The disadvantage is that you have to check out afterwards which contact is good for what. And then you stimulate through. Imagine now you would have twisted the whole cuff electrode by 40, 50 degrees in one direction or the others. The general outcome would be the same, but on different channels. That means if you check it out afterwards, it doesn't matter. And that, this is a real advantage um, if you think on distributing that system into clinical practice. You do not need to... Uh, very high level specialist, you can do general training and the selection of the correct channels can be done independent from the surgery. That is very good if you have to check intra during the surgery if you're on the right spot. That is a nightmare. Yeah, that, that prolongs the surgery, that makes the surgeon nervous and surgeons quite often don't want to take care of electrical stuff around that. Yeah, they want to do the surgery. So that was good. That means with those cuff electrodes, we could reach the target of getting fascicle selectivity there. Um, so all good. One of the applications which has been discussed for decades was activation of the ankle joint. 
Um, and activation of the ankle joint means you can do that up and down. This is what you normally want to do. If you walk, you lift your foot. If you tr play around with your foot, you know you have a certain kind of rotation, inward, outward, and you have an eversion and inversion, so, so you can also tilt it a little bit. This is what you don't want to have while stimulation, flexion, or um, extension. Imagine, you, you might have experienced that when walking on uneven ground, you want to walk and then your foot rotates while walking. You get completely unstable and it hurts, just a side effect, but this is nothing you want to get. And, and therefore stimulations should be selective on flexion extension and should probably stabilize the rest of the joint. And if you look on the anatomy, um, and this is now uh, a one-to-one -one switch from the human to the rat. So it's, it's, the rat foot is a little bit different from the human foot, but, but we have some, some similarities, and similarities means that we also have um, connections in humans over the joints. That uh, means it's, it's really hard to predict that if you have here um, something from from one joint from one bone to a certain bone and from another bone um, to the same bone it means depending on the strength of the muscle contraction those lines um, you get probably the same movement or you get a different movement depending on a third muscle activation that that is really complex and the number of muscles that are activated via those nerves over certain uh, levels is really manifold, so it's not an easy task to get a prediction there. And experiments have been done. Um, while this blob here on the lower right is the nerve, the, the nerve of a rat with the common perineal fascicle, uh, with a gastrocnemius fascicle um, and the tibialis anterior. And um, LG, MG is the gastrocnemius, uh, common perineal, lateral gastro medial and lateral gastrocnemius, and the tibialis. And depending which muscle is activated, um, you get a movement in one direction or the other. You can imagine this is uh, in. Uh, Plantar flexion positive means plantar, uh, negative means dorsi. So up and down, left and right. This is what is shown here in four quadrants. And depending which electrode um, with four contacts here around the nerve you activate, you can drive the foot in those three quadrants, the fourth cannot be reached. And this is, if this is good enough for your purpose, then you can use that four contact cuff electrode to drive the foot in one direction or the other. Um, this foot thing has been applied as drop foot stimulator. So after hemiparesia, hemiplegia after stroke, if one side is paralyzed and you cannot lift your foot, that means that you might stumble while walking if you cannot lift your foot in the swing phase. So if you stimulate it in the swing phase, there's no obstacle and you can step. Um, now seeing all those knowledge you need with the cuff electrodes and the stimulation, you can imagine that there is a high variability in, in, in um, success. And the easy way to do that swing phase would be to have a metal uh, thing in the shoe, which you can strap with two uh, Velcro straps around your lower leg. And then you have an angle that l just lifts your foot at any time. It costs about five to ten bucks, while such an implant with surgical intervention is about forty, fifty thousand. Yeah, and, and that was one of the things uh, while um, this device has been placed, uh, put from the market. There have been other reasons, but this is also one thing where people say, well, um, I can try it with a superficial stimulator that's a bit worse with the selectivity. I can do that. Or I can put that metal 
angle into my shoes with a Velcro and put a nice pair of trousers over it, um, that also works halfway. It doesn't work that good. It, you see that. It's an asymmetric uh, gait that you get since, since the foot never uh, drops down, even if it could drop down. But the question is, how much effort do you like to put in there? How much money are you willing to spend? Um, and this is a question that goes beyond the technical feasibility, uh, but, but goes really in, in rehabilitation concepts, in, in uh, societal questions beyond the pure technology. So, um, going back to technology, um, we can, instead of having those steering currents, persons tried out that you can also use pre-pulses, and we are now at the point where we ask the question, do we get thin fibers before we get thick fibers? So, regular stuff, thin fiber needs higher excitation threshold than a thick fiber, and since this is to the power of two, we get larger differences at higher uh, distances from the electrode to the fiber, right? Um, if we have now some pre-pulses, and the pre-pulses are then still sub-threshold with the idea getting the superficial fibers, getting the fibers refractory by stochastic inactivation of the ion channels. Um, we get here a similar result in the early phase and then the undesired result in the late phase. And if we play around with the pre-pulses, we get an inversion. That means um, we get something where the threshold of the thick fibers is larger than the threshold of the, si of the thin fibers. Yeah, that's the good thing here. So in that shaded area, the 10 microns fiber would be activated before we activate the 20 microns fiber. That is the advantage. However, if we look on the charge, of the rectangular pulse and look how much charge we get here with the pre-pulses you easily see that we have much more charge at the pre-pulses and that means we have to take care of the question does the electrode deliver that amount of charge and what does the charge do with our target nerve cells beyond the excitation. Is there something where we probably stress the cells and drive them into cell death if we do so? Or do we more on the electrochemical side? It could also be that we change the environment. More pulse could mean more hydrogen. More hydrogen means a lower pH value. Lower pH value means we might activate certain foreign body reactions there um, that cause then more reactive tissue growth over time, for example. All things we have to consider um, beyond that question, which fiber do we get? Um, the most crazy thing I've seen, no, the no, second most crazy thing I've, I've seen are our long pulses. Normally we are in the range of, if you remember that strength, duration, chronoxy, rio base curve, we should have the chronoxy around 100 microseconds. Yeah, so probably 200 microseconds are a good pulse width. Um, if we do so, um, or do it even more severe, so 10 microseconds, versus 350 or even 500 microseconds pulse width. If we have a mixed nerve and what you see on the x-axis is here the time, that means the, the earlier a signal comes, the faster it is. The, if it comes later, it's, it's, it's a slower signal. And if we take these this, uh, short pulses, we get the fast signals first, 
And if we have nearly full recruitment of the fast signals here, we get the slow fiber signals at second. However, if we increase the length of the pulse, we get both. And if we further increase the amplitude, the fast fiber signal dies out and we get only the thin fiber signal. If we now look on the amplitudes here, I at least get completely dizzy because we go from 0.65 milliamps or let's say 1 milliamp to up to 3.7 milliamps plus the additional length of the pulse which is a manifold plus this is something I haven't told you so far look here on the decay this is not an artifact that is true we have a slowly decaying pulse going to zero this is due to that anodic break excitation that we had early on in the stimulation pulses that you don't get a second stimulation by switching off the pulse under the anode and to sneak out we have that decay here in an exponential way since we take the advantage of a capacitor discharge that is the way you can can realize that in an analog circuit manner if you want to do it digitally you can take whatever pulse shape which is much more which is easier for example a straight line or or square shape thing whatever to decay the pulse towards zero um, that you don't that you prevent the anodic breaks excitation. Yeah. Okay. Left side is short pulse, right? Yeah. Which is the so when you have a short pulse and not a high amplitude, you activate the fast fibers first. Yeah, so the thick ones. No, always the thick ones. Always thick ones. It was with the pre-pulses that you have, that, that, that you have the reverse. Yeah. Yep. Always thick comes first. Yeah. And this is again, you can explain that with, with that conduction velocity in a cuff between one contact site and the other. Yeah, and the longer the pulse is, the longer the hyperpolarization is. That's the easy way of understanding. But the, the ground truth is, as written down here, we have a modulation of the sodium channels under the anodes that really cause uh, the suppression of the signals in the thick fibers. So, very complex. And the, the key thing is that one here that you come to the point where you get thick and thin fibers. That means you have to somehow overcome this threshold. Um, and people said, OK, we have the latest stimulators that go really fast to that 4 milliamp, 500 micros microseconds pulse, and that's good. And then it was tried out. This is one application where you want to get thin fibers without getting thick ones when emptying your bladder the same spinal root, so kind of peripheral nerve structure, um, activates the sphincter muscle and the bladder wall muscle. And you don't want to compress the bladder wall muscle while compressing the sphincter muscle. That doesn't make any sense, right? If you close your urinary bladder and then you try to get it empty. Um, therefore, the idea is to, to get the bladder wall muscle, thin fibers, smooth muscle, slow, um, before getting the thick fibers um, and the fast striated muscle of, of the sphincter. And that was the idea and then turned out that this switching on um, unfortunately activates the pain fibers first for the first 10 seconds. Um, and then it turned out that <coughs> we should suppress everything before we sneak into, into that stuff. And this is, to my, to my knowledge, still under investigation, how to get those switching on effects, um, how to overcome them. One idea is the high frequency block. And I have to say, we have to take care here. We, we are in biomedical engineering. So for, for 
Me, high frequency and biomedical engineering is, a, is at 20 kilohertz. For my colleagues from radio frequency engineering, this is still direct current, right? So uh, we have to take care. That was always my, my most, my funniest discussion with a former colleague of mine who, who started to work uh, at two gigahertz and above, yeah? And I told him, wow, yeah, do, can you have your device that measures high frequency at 20 kilohertz? And yeah, we had a lot of fun with that. So the idea, and I have here numbers from 300 hertz to 20 kilohertz, and, and that is a bit an historic view. In early days, people started 300 hertz, up to 2 kilohertz, whatever. Now it, turned, it came out that 15 to 20 kilohertz is it's a much better frequency range for that. If you apply a sinusoidal current um, over two contacts, you can block the nerve. And that seems to be a clever thing. If you can block the nerve and then you reduce the blockade, the you get the thin fibers first out of that blockade and the thick fibers last, because that's the other way of thin f thick fibers first, if you tell the story in the other way around. And then you can stimulate whatever you like to stimulate and with that second high frequency block, only the ones you want to get past, get past. They pass. Um, However, as we see, we need a rectangular pulse shape generator plus a sinusoidal one, plus we need uh, another electrode set of two contacts, so it gets, things get more sophisticated with that. And that was the reason why a certain person said, well, that's all too complex for me. Um, can we go with another approach? And another approach that never went beyond the first proof of concept for certain reasons. And I still do not know the reasons, because if I ask my colleague who's still active, he says, oh, that's a beautiful idea. Then why didn't you commercialize that? And then always some sentence comes that, that tell me I should not ask deeper. Um, so it might be that it doesn't work that well, or that the, the hardware behind that is too complex. And the idea is, that you shape a pulse with multiple contact sites, multiple means more than three, five or seven, uh, plus, minus, plus, minus, plus, minus. And the distances of adjacent contacts are close to the distance of the nodes of Ranvier that we have. That means in thicker fibers, large distance, thinner fibers, smaller distance. That is the idea. And if you do that here in a clever way, you find out that you can reverse the excitation threshold by that. Idea probably if you are closer together, you can get the ideal gradient for smaller distance nodes of Ranvier uh, than you get with larger distance nodes of Ranvier. Yeah, that, that is the idea behind that. The theory uh, goes with that cable equation there, um, and theory and practice go hand in hand. That's good. You can either use the practical approach or the theoretical one. And, and there was a very sophisticated theoretical paper first on that multipolar electrode here, and then some experimental work followed showed that works in principle, but you can imagine having nine contact sites instead of one uh, for one channel that's very sophisticated and having then the very complex hardware in the background is probably something that is good for fundamental research, but it's a bit hard to transfer into clinical practice. We did some years ago, so now 12 years or 11 years ago, a study with a question, is it more clever if we go transversely through the nerve than having that longitudinal approach? The disadvantage is we are not in line with the arrangement of the nodes of Ranvier. That means we get somehow a longitudinal gradient, but we're going more towards the transversal selectivity on that. Um, to be honest, we, we stole a little bit other person's approaches 
So there was already an approach that you take a wire and pull it longitudinal through the nerve. So you get an ideal fascicle selectivity of the fascicle where you pull the thing through. We thought we, we want to use that to deliver sensory feedback on, on arms. Um, and there you need all the contact points of a hand or many of them. Well, well, on one wire per fascicle that are too many wires for us. So can't we do that transversely? And to, to get a good overview, we thought we should compare that transversal approach to the longitudinal approach and to the cuff approach to see where we are with respect to, to thresholds and with respect to spatial selectivity. In spatial selectivity, there's something like a selectivity index, and that is always how much do I activate what I like to activate in the numerator of an equation and in the denominator of an equation is how much do I activate at all. So that means if I would activate my desired fascicle and the rest is only my desired fascicle, it's one. Yeah? Numerator, denominator is the same. If I activate a little bit what I desire and a lot of other stuff, I have a huge denominator, a small numerator, and the value drops down. That is the idea of that selectivity index. Um, do I have that? No, I don't have it here. So you have to believe me that we were in a threshold transversal similar to longitudinal and much lower than the cuff, since the electrodes on the parameter of the cuff are at a further distance than the contact points that are directly inside the fascicles. The question was, does that stuff stay stable? So if you implant that, does it stay stable over 30 days? 30 days is a magic number from the international standard 10993, um, the subchronic phase, uh, which you have to prove in developments going towards humans that something can stay safe and stable for 30 days before you go beyond 30 days for longer time periods. And we did that in, in pigs and learned a lot about the behavior of pigs. Um, they are born to roll in the mud. If you implant something, they still roll on the, in the mud. If they have no mud, they take the concrete floor. And if you have very fragile implants and they roll for 30 days over your fragile implants, um, you might find out that your cables and connectors are no longer look as they've looked before implantation. So that took us about one and a half years to come to a solution that we made that, that study run. And it was really nothing about implants and cables, it was all about pig behavior. My, my favorite approach was that we went to, to store Toys R Us and bought something, you know, that, that colorful plastic for toddlers with bells and things where they can, can uh, uh, play around with, and, and the pigs love that. <laughs> and with that, ha already half of our implants survived, that they were just busy with that beautiful toy. <laughs> So, but the question is, what about selectivity? Does the stimulation threshold stay the same? Does it move? I would suppose it increases due to foreign body reaction, but does it still stay in the chemical safe range? That was the question here, and at the end, we were halfway happy. We found out that it's probably clever not to implant only one device, but two at a certain angle that you cover more of those many fascicles that you have. And that was the pilot study in about 2013. One pilot patient, uh, nine years after amputation, often fireworks um, accident, um, two electrodes in the ulna nerve, two electrodes in, or two devices in the ulna, two, two devices in the medium nerve, 14 channels per device, seven channels looked to the left of the device, seven channels looked to the right of the device. So it was on a loop, the electrodes looked in different directions. Um, cables, well, this is how it looked in real. Uh, that is the nerve. Um, 
The implants are so small that you can hardly see them. What you see are here the connection uh, between the micro implant and the cable. These are the cables and you don't see any connector. So on the first patient we got coverage of the inner side of the thumb and the index finger and we good got coverage on certain other parts of the hand. So we were more or less happy with that. If we look on the succeeding uh, study with another three patients up to six months, you find out or you see that there is coverage from patient to patient in a different manner, but you always get part of the fingers that you can use to get to deliver sensory feedback during grasping. Um, it also varies here on the perception. Um, there's a lot of vibration perception. If there's pain, you should of course no longer use those electrodes because that hurts. Um, and then you find out there is a kind of proprioception pressure which warms electricity. And I would say electricity is anything a patient cannot detect or classify. It's a kind of self-fulfilling prophecy. If you know that there is current and you touch it and you feel something that you cannot understand what you feel, you would say it's current, right? I do that that way, you know? It's a kind of self-fulfilling prophecy. Therefore, I'm, I'm not very astonished that there's so much feeling of electricity because they all know that this is electrical stimulation. Um, the same has been done in, in another study with three patients after above the knee amputation uh, during to, to get back a uh, sensation of the foot and even for me even more exciting to get back ideas about the knee angle and those persons could tell you the knee angle so they had a feeling about their muscles that were activated that were no longer there and they could say and, and there's a spooky movie um, where somebody has an artificial lack and moves the leg and a patient without the leg is lying in bed said, oh, my, my leg had that degree. Yeah, really pointing that out and that helped persons in walking, having the sensory feedback where, where the knee is, where the leg is and how the ground reaction forces are. That was, that was of course, all research, no, not yet a product. product. So uh, downside is, uh, has been that um, we did not have any fully implantable system uh, since we have four, co four devices with 16 channels each, so 14 contact sites plus two ground electrodes. That makes 14 plus two makes 16. 16 is a number of channels that you get as a connector. So you get 16 or 32 or, and then it ends, but this is not a medical connector and it's not an implantable connector. And that means it, there's nothing around with 16 channels that you can implant that's small enough. There's one company who has an adapter from two eight channels to one 16 channel um, connector, but we would have needed four of them, and one of them is already that long and that wide, so you would have so much material in a single patient um, that is really questionable. And that was the reason where we as a whole consortium of 10, 14 research groups said, well, it's probably better to go with percutaneous connectors to investigate the, the hypothesis, the research hypothesis, that clever stimulation can deliver sensory feedback to those persons in a way that they get lower metabolic load, better cognitive integration and better overall performance of that. This has been proven now the last 10 years uh, and now we are back to start and have to find out how do we get that, those results into a fully implantable system. And then the, the other question, if, if one would say, oh, oh, that sounds so cool, I apply as CEO for a new startup company. Um, the other question is how much would that cost and, uh, and is there enough benefit for the patients to take the risk of that implantation and for the health insurances to reimburse that system. 
And probably I can give you an answer to that question in the next, after 10 years from now. Uh, but this, this is a serious one if you really go from research results um, into, into commercialization or bringing something in, in regular rehabilitation practice um, that you have to consider those, all those aspects beyond the, the primary research questions. And th this is the hard part then to find out is this is a business model um, can I deliver things to patients and is this stable and, and it comes with a certain responsibility yeah that you do not shut down deliver things to the first hundred patients and then shut down your company because it doesn't pay off um, then those hundred patients are again lost uh, with their despair that nobody repairs the implants or something fails yeah so, so it, it, it's not that easy that decision but this is beyond this uh, topic and this lecture. And to summarize there, topic was selective stimulation. Um, I think you could get that flavor. It's really important for a good performance. You need selectivity to target your fibers you want to get and not to target all the other things that might cause uh, side effects. There are several approaches. We always have to balance advantages and disadvantages. Um, all of those things are accompanied by an increased energy demand. So again, advantages, disadvantages to balance out, um, as well as uh, potential electrode damage and nerve damage. And this is still an open field. Um, one thing I did not mention here was the idea to go more to the target organ. The more you go to the target organ, the more specific the nerve is. And if you're very close, you have probably less side effects. With a disadvantage, you need more contacts distributed over a wider area in the body. Um, especially for walking, um, there is something like the central pattern generator in the lumbar spinal cord, um, a kind of system on the segmental level which coordinates movements and it could be shown in, in certain experiments that you can activate their subgroups of nerve cells in the spinal cord that then activate the nerve fibers to your target muscles in a way the brain does it. That means it's a weight supporting stance, it's less fatigue um, and it works. Uh, Vivian Mushawar is doing the fundamental research at the University of Alberta in, in uh, Edmonton in Canada and there have been uh, studies in the US by Susan Harkemar and by Grégoire Coutin at EPFL in Switzerland uh, in humans that for certain kind of paralysis uh, that you can use that, that epidural lumbar stimulation to make them stand again and walk certain steps. Um, it's not yet on a product level, but it could be that this is a promising approach um, for a very small subgroup of persons. Yeah, with that, I'm at the very end for today. Thank you very much. Uh, hope we see each other again next week, then with an another flavor of electrical stimulation and the consequences and the effects that we have. Thank you very much.